Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rebecca Leapline. Who's that, you ask? Who are you? It's Rebecca? me. Yay! <laughs> Hi! Who are you? Uh, I I am a, another former student of Mr. Ettinger's and a friend of present the company. Show. The yeah. show. The yeah. show. <laughs> I've been listening since uh, you started. And you were a lifeline to me when I was away at school. It's, so it is surreal to be here. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been a student of Mr. Nurse for uh, my whole life. So I know a few things. I've picked a few things up over the years. And uh, I love to talk about theology. So I fun. believe it was you in a recent conversation about the theology of sarcasm. Am I remembering that right? <laughs> Yeah, that was me. <laughs> yeah. I, I wish I had a recording of that because I kind of like heard it peripherally from another room. And I was like, that <laughs> sounds very interesting. Well, I, I have the outline that I prepared before I brought it to <laughs> to my elders to discuss. So I can get you that outline. <laughs> I would be very interested to read that. Well, today we are talking about walls. Um, but first, let's get some foundational ideas out of the way with what the endeavor of biblical theology is. Because what we're doing today is not going to show up in a systematics textbook. You're not going to find an entry on walls. You're not going to find an entry on trees or water, except maybe as relating to how baptism should be conducted. <laughs> um, so how, how are we approaching this sort of nebulous topic, Greg? Mm -hmm. Well, a little background information for those who may need it or want it. When we study theology in our schools or seminaries and such, uh, we divide it into at least two different perspectives. The one that most people are familiar with is called systematics or systematic theology. It has grown out of the church's need to defend its life against heretics. When the heretics came and said, well, God didn't create anything, God doesn't create stuff because God is pure spirit, the church had to think that through, and its response, in part, was the Apostles' Creed, as well as Irenaeus' is against heresies. And then when heretics came along and said, well, okay, well, there's a creator, and among the things he created was Jesus, because Jesus is a created <laughs> being. The church said, no, uh, Jesus is God. He's not kind of God, sort of God, almost God, more God than you can possibly imagine without actually being God. The church responded to Nicaea with the creed that says, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made of one substance, one essence with the Father. And, and so, throughout church history, when heretics have, as it were, gone for the jugular, the church has of necessity responded with propositional statements that say, not that, but this. And not that either, but this, because there's usually two sides you can err on. And, and, and so, in defense of its life, the church has given a lot of thought to things that are very crucial to the gospel. Uh, the doctrine of creation, the deity of Christ, the the dual um, nature, the hypostatic union of the two natures in Christ, uh, the deity and the person of the Holy Spirit, and as time has unfolded, the sufficiency of Scripture, justification by faith, and and other cardinal doctrines, the virgin birth, the literal second coming, and and, and that's more a very difficult synthesis to to come up with what does the entire bible teach right. about one specific topic any topic that's going to be quite a project it's going to be quite a project and it takes a lot of of minds um dedicated to the service of the lord discipline to his word spread out over history now god has given the church some great theologians some great teachers who were after a fashion geniuses who saw the whole picture and were able to stand up at key moments and be the key figure, but very few of them nail down everything. Uh, you can think of Athanasius at Nicaea, did profound work, and yet 
after Nicaea, there was still a backlash saying, no, mean old Athanasius, he got it wrong. And it took a new generation to come along and fill in the corners, as it were, and deal with uh, background exposition, redefining terms, so that by the time we get to the Council of Constantinople, everybody is now speaking the same language. And yet, again and again, throughout, throughout the generations, the true deity of Christ keeps coming up as an issue for debate, and, and every generation needs new systematic theologians who have a grasp of what the Bible says about this particular topic. And because it's so important, there's this thing of defending key gospel truths, it is very easy to think that that's all of, or at least the bulk of God's revelation to us, those key doctrines. And, and yes, they've, they've increased over time. There was a time when no one questioned the virgin birth. That became more of a thing in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, when the whole idea of the miraculous was suddenly up for grabs. <laughs> uh, and and we, we've, we've kept adding to it, and yet you can talk about, well, in the, in the early 1900s, the many uh, Bible-believing Christians spoke of the fundamentals. Here are the things you must believe. And the problem was not that they were wrong about that. They were absolutely right. These are things that the church has to believe. The problem is when you don't connect them into the overall system of truth that's in Scripture. Because it's kind of like trying to build a fence when all you have are the fence posts. Mm. And there's a lot of maneuvering you can do by going through the fence posts, um, going between them. And so we need to come back sometimes and look at the whole of Scripture. I appreciated your opening. Because if you pick up a book on systematic theology and you look up trees in the index or table of contents, you're not going to find it. If you have, if you do an exhaustive search, you might find references to the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and perhaps to the cross as the tree. But you're probably not going to find anything that joins them together and explains how they're connected and, and, and says, in fact, why trees? Yeah, here's why it's important that the cross was a tree, the yeah. way there were trees in the garden. And and why did God use trees in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, and so we're coming to talk about um, Nehemiah building walls. We won't probably get to much of that today. But it is appropriate to start talking about walls. And again, you open your, your book on systematics, and you're probably going to find any references to walls. And again, word search, he's the he's broken down the middle wall of partition. Uh, I'm not thinking of anything else right now. I may be thinking there may be something I'm missing. Uh, the thief comes in over the wall instead of through the gate. Yeah, that, that's more of a word search for um, you know all of Scripture. Or it might show up in terms of, I don't know, something. Uh, but we don't spend a lot of time there. And... Uh, and then the next step is we, we come back and we look, say, at the garden. Let's take trees as an example. And I just ask, why a tree? There are people who are uncomfortable with that question. One, they've never heard it asks. What do you mean why a tree? It's a tree. It was just that God picked a tree. Yes, but why did God pick a tree? And it's not like, well, God stepped out of the garden, looked around, said, huh, I need something. Um, won't use the skunk, rock, no. Um, Hey, a tree is kind of what I want. I'll use. <laughs> no, it's part of his own self-revelation that he even made trees, and when he made them, he knew what part. You know, parts bad word. God doesn't have parts. What <laughs> revelation of himself he was giving in said trees, and how that revelation would unfold and flower, eh, bud bloom, <laughs> um, put down roots throughout redemptive history not only to the cross, but beyond to the New Jerusalem. And as we come to Scripture, one of the things that behooves us to do is simply look and see what God's actually doing. There are times when we have to jump around from book to book, passage to passage, and find all of the references, say, about limited atonement or justification by faith or the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Uh, and any uh, pastor worth his salt will have been well trained to do those things because that's those are the boundaries that keep you from going off into the darkness, that keep you going into heresy. But there's a whole lot more to the Bible. And if that's all you know, if, if systematics is all you know, you come to a lot of passages and you kind of look around and say, well, uh, here's a story about a young woman who needs to get married because she's poor and has a poor mother-in-law to look after. 
I guess maybe something about the love of God. Moving on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it leaves you not knowing what to do with art or artists sometimes. Yeah, it, it, this is so. It has impl- impl- implications beyond our immediate understanding of the Bible to our application of the Bible. Now, here's the thing. As we come and we look at these things, again, let's say trees, we can start looking at all the times the trees show up. Uh, it is easy to be, it's easy for someone to say, but you're, you're just following your imagination. <laughs> Who do you think gave you that imagination? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Rebecca, exactly. And <laughs> you could turn to people and say, so, and in following systematics, you're following logic. Well, logic is obviously clearer and more superior and superior to imagination. Uh, Arius was great on logic. Mm-hmm. Arius was the supreme rationalist. He, he, it was very simple. The Trinity didn't make sense. And so his whole canon for creating an alternate religion out of Christianity was reason. Yes, imagination can get out of control. So can reason. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, we'll, in, it's intellectually dishonest to think you can come to a text without supplying imagination yes. of any kind. When you read, you bring something as the reader. You, you're not a blank slate. No, you can't you're not. Be. And this in part is where general revelation comes in. We're born into a world that's full of things, full of stuff. My pastor used to say, we're born naked in the world, but we don't come into a naked world. I'm looking out my window. I see trees. Those trees were there long before I moved into this house. I think I may be older than that big oak tree, but maybe not. It may be older than me. The The oak tree that stood behind my parents' property in Anderson was much older than I than I am, was. I come into a world of trees, and I know what a tree looks like. I know what a tree does, and the tree is not there by accident. God made trees, and God made these trees, and God has purposes for trees, and he has a purpose for the tree I'm looking at, largely, it seems to be to attack the foundation of our house, which gives me <laughs> a job to do, imposes obligations upon me to protect our house from its encroaching roots. You know, this, and someone could say, well, that, you're, you're muddying the waters. What does that have to do with theology? Kind of like everything. Because mm-hmm. when John said, behold, the Lamb of God, he expected people to know what sheep were and mm-hmm. to bring to the table a whole knowledge of shepherding and sheep and what you do with sheep, sheep shearing, eating lamb, sacrifice. Yeah, they come- Concrete experience. Concrete (laughs) experience. Mm -hmm. But none of it is, are things that God found lying around and said, huh, I can do something. Because last night my my wife was watching um, a little do-it-yourself video. It took me a while to figure out it was one big advertisement for Dollar Tree. (laughs) <laughs> but once I realized they were saying Dollar Tree every other sentence, it, I, I, I got it. But it was all about going into Dollar Tree and just finding these random things that nobody wants <laughs> and making cool craft projects out of them. You can take this and one of these and two of these and this, and you look at this beautiful thing. You may, well, you can. I don't think most people would have thought of it, and I'm glad you did, I guess. Nothing else, you're, you're racking up sales for Dollar Tree. Uh, but that's not how we come into God's world. There is nothing random here. Everything is predestined, ordained, organized, arranged, and is revelatory of of who God is. Uh, And so as we read the Bible and we read about light and darkness on day one, or we read about trees on day three, or the sun, moon, and stars on day four, God expects we that we know what in the world he's talking about, that we've actually looked up at the sky and, and, and seen the sun. Even if we're blind, we've at least, at least felt its warmth on our faces. And people have said, that's because there's this thing called the sun up there. Uh, and, and as we proceed through the Bible, God takes these things that he has made, and he begins to set up literary patterns. Well, the question again becomes, well, how do you know that's a pattern? <laughs> The same way mathematicians recognize certain patterns when they see recurring numbers, you uh, pattern the idea of pattern is built into us again by God. This mm-hmm. is not an accident. It's not something we're making up. We've been taught how to look for patterns. If nothing else, you can look at day the, the first creation week, and you see these seven things that come in a particular order. And strangely enough, as you make your way through the rest of the Bible, 
oftentimes we see seven things or seven days or seven panels of information that bear a striking resemblance to the to the creation week. You get to uh, the book of Revelation, it's laid out um, among other ways you can lay it out. It's real, You can lay it out in patterns of seven. And when with the seven, there are seven seals and seven trumpets and seven churches and seven lampstands and so on. What, what are the checks? Well, the checks, I think, are twofold. One, systematics. Mm -hmm. If our imagination takes us to the place where we start saying Jesus isn't God, well, then we've gone a, a cliff someplace. Mm -hmm. And we need, we need to reclimb and get back where we need to be. We need to get back on the straight road. Uh, closely related to that or interwoven with systematics is the testimony of the church. And this is why we need the creeds and the confessions. If I find that my my study of patterns in the Old Testament is contradicting the New Testament says clearly and flatly, then I've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I don't get to say, well, you know, uh, Paul got it wrong because really what he should have said, no, it's, <laughs> we, we are bound by the, the totality of scripture and what the believing church has said. We're not allowed to be lone rangers and make stuff up. Mm -hmm. the, the interesting thing is that so often, when you are doing biblical biblical theology properly, you find all these wonderful patterns, and you look back and you 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 pull the whole picture together and say, "Wow, that's a great way." I know that that's what systematics has been saying all this time. It just <laughs> it just comes now with color and sound. Um, it it's 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 one thing to say that Jesus died for sinners, but to see the bloody lamb with uh, the man laying his hands upon it—that's. It adds texture, dimension, color, thickness. Mm -hmm. Something to your, what, your heart can yeah. get its teeth into. Mixed metaphors there, but <laughs> it gets into your heart a little bit better when there's, there's yeah, that because, texture to it. Because it appeals to the whole man and not mm -hmm. simply to an abstract version of the intellect, which is sometimes what we get when we start talking about reason and rationality. We're not really talking about the way the human mind actually works. We're talking about an idealized version that was born in the Enlightenment. Uh, and, and that is a real problem. When theology degenerates to these series of propositions memorized and said in this order, and there's really nothing else to say, we miss something. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's a real danger. Um, so with, with all of that said, we're going to do a little exploration of the biblical theology of walls. And if at any point we cross a line in systematics, then some people should be sending us little emails that say, wait, that's heresy because, and you can that's appeal to That's heresy, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, we all to answer to Patrick here. Yes, yes. <laughs> can appeal to the Belgian Confession of the Westminster Standards or some such thing, the Nicene Creed, and say, no, you've crossed the line, at which point we better pick perk up our ears and say, whoa, what, what? Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think that's going to be a real problem. What we're going to see are basic principles that that attach the fence posts, as it were, to one another, that bind things together uh, by a less direct, less clear. God, could, you know, God could have said all of this in a very thick book on theology. And there's a reason He gave us stories, histories, biographies, mm -hmm. poems, psalms. Uh, there is something in God that needs to communicate, and therefore something in us that needs to be communicated that way. Mm -hmm. And when we say, but yeah, the poetry is nice, but I'm not a poetry guy, so I'll just look up at the Pauline letters. You're going to miss a lot, and you're not doing justice to who God is and what God knows we need to hear. Can I give an example? Yeah, of, sure. Yeah. Um, there's a, a Christian ska band from the 90s. Uh, Rebecca will know them. The W's? I do not. Oh, I will have to give you a CD because you'll love them. Okay. Um, if you like ska, some people just really don't like ska, but they have a song called Devil is Bad. It was a big hit. It was on WoW 2000. Um, and the first verse is just telling the story of Eve walking in the garden and the snake coming and tempting her. Um, and the chorus is is fun and boppy, and it's not what Eve actually said, unfortunately. It's, you are the devil, and the devil is bad. Go right out of here, that kind of thing. Um, but then the second verse is Jesus walking in the wilderness mm. and being tempted by the devil. And he does say, you are the devil, and the devil is bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I remember using that song 
for so many things. Like I, I used to DJ for the swing dance club at school, right? And it was a very fun one to dance to. So we'd use it all the time. And then I was dancing to it one time and I was like, wait a second. These two concepts are related. <laughs> They're telling me the same story twice, but it has two different endings and just, you know, things that, you know, shouldn't have been a, a huge revelation at the moment but when it's told in a different way like of course you know that jesus was tempted and he succeeded where adam failed but to hear it in that way it opens your eyes to different parallels and i think again gets into your heart a little bit more yeah that reminds me my my first pastor actually made that connection and 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 with more depth when I was very young, and I remember him talking about it. But strangely enough, I remember years later, him asking me what I thought of biblical theology, and, and I hadn't exp had any interaction with it at all. I had, but I didn't know that's what it was. Hmm. All I'd heard was stuff like, well, Adam believed this, but Noah was smarter and had it more correct when he said, but Abraham knew even more. And hmm. he, it, it was sort of the idea of an evolving knowledge of God where things in the past may not have been all that accurate. Mm -hmm. And so we stand at the end of that and we're really accurate, but the Older Testament may not be. And and that was what little I had heard was that. That's not biblical theology. Mm -hmm. That's no. liberal <laughs> garbage. Um, it's also incredibly depressing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and given biblical theology and, and given that it's all true revelation from God, we are not ashamed in the least to jump from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. And expect to find the same message in the same God. It's not, mm -hmm. although things become clearer and fleshed out, the message doesn't change. God doesn't evolve. And the Word doesn't evolve. We just get a little clearer explanation the closer we come to Christ. So, back, yes, thank you. Good, good, good illustration. And that's the kind of thing that if you are simply a good reader, you will pick up on. Um, read T.S. Eliot, read Nathaniel Hawthorne, mm -hmm. read, read uh, Melville or Shakespeare or Spencer. And if you can't read to see imagery and patterns, you're going to miss a lot. You're going to wonder what all the big fuss is about anyway. Why are, these, why are these writers so big? What's this thing about this black veil over your eyes or this, this woman with this red letter? And why is the night keep falling into temptation and someone has to say, you keep going through this? <laughs> Uh, one of the reasons we teach literature is so that you can read the Bible, not simply as a book of random statements here and there that we have to find. And here's something else about systematics. Most systematic theologies have a list of scripture references in the back, as well as the topical mm -hmm. index. It would be interesting, well, for me, I've actually done this, but if no one has, <clears throat> go back and look at that scripture evidence, that scripture um find that scriptural index and see which books of the Bible it quotes from. Mm -hmm. Most of the Old Testament histories are exempted a little bit from Genesis around the time of Abraham and from, from the creation week. A little bit here, Exodus, Numbers, not so much, Deuteronomy's not so much. Leviticus, I mean, is about worship and you're not going <laughs> to see many references. Joshua, no. Judges, no. Ruth, uh, uh Samuel King's Chronicles, probably not. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. Uh, you get when we come to Psalms because Psalms celebrate the attributes of God so much. We'll get we'll get a lot there, and some in Job. Proverbs, not very much after the first few chapters, at least, and and so on. Some because they're looking because of the nature of systematics, which is not bad. But it's just incomplete. They're looking for propositional statements about key doctrines, and those books generally simply don't have them. That does not mean for a moment that th those doctrines, the reality of who God is and how God saves, is, are, is it all absent from those books? But you have to read, and you have to read with a little bit of imagination, and you have to read in context, and you have to follow pattern and image. Anyway, we keep saying we're going to talk about walls, so let's talk about walls. <laughs> we go back to, now, now, even here, we have to supply something. Uh, I'm not in Nehemiah, I'm in Genesis, in chapter 3. And we're told this, verse 22, The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Dot, dot, dot. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man 
and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim, the flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the Tree of Life. The word wall does not appear. Mm -mm. It is possible there was not a wall. It was possible it was a sheer drop down a cliff. <laughs> but the point is the garden was enclosed. How do we know? Because the cherubim were put on one side of it. Mm -hmm. And because a single sword was able to guard all approaches to it. There's an in and an out. There's an in and out. And interestingly enough, there appears to be only one way into the presence of God. Now, once I say that and say it that way, that resonates all the way through Scripture. Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't highlight it and, and attach sparklers and things. I mean, but, there's a flaming sword, to be fair. <laughs> he did, yeah, cherubim. I mean, what exactly? And once we find out what cherubim look like later on in Ezekiel, <laughs> that's kind of a big deal. Um, whether or not the rest of the garden was a wall, we know that it was, I get asked, how do you know? Okay, we know it was a mountain or a plateau. How do you know? Water runs Water downhill. downhill. <laughs> I once said this to a pastor, how, how do you, it wasn't from my denomination, uh, but he was a stickler. If the Bible doesn't say it, you can't believe it. The Bible has to absolutely say it. So how do you know that there was, that, that, that it was on a mountain? And I just looked at him and said, the water runs downhill. And that caught him for a second. I said, and in Ezekiel, Eden is called the mountain of God. So you want, you want something very specific. There it is. Now, whether or not there were walls around it, don't know, but it was enclosed either by walls or by sheer ravines and cliffs so that there was one way in, one way out, and no other way. So maybe and it's significant, it. you know, it's not necessarily like, the, like, in terms of authority of information, right, this one is way down the list, but historically, the shape of a garden in literature has this very specific yeah. shape where it has a wall around it and then there's a circle in the middle with water. The fountain is in the center and it's surrounded by sort of a square that goes with the walls. Um, yeah, I was going to say, since I started to say the word except, and I don't know, we can edit it out. I was going to say except flying in by pteranodon or something, but <laughs> um, probably the, uh, the cherubim could deal with that. There is a verse in Song of Solomon, another book that generally gets not referenced in mm, systematic mm -hmm. theologies. This is chapter 4, verse 12, and here it compares the garden to the bride. Mm -hmm. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. And it goes on and describes the garden, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. So what you're describing actually is in the Bible, but you have to get halfway through before you run into it. So, we look at this Garden of Eden. Oh, and that's also why I like Turkish rugs, well, by like the way. Turkish yeah. rugs. Turkish rugs are designed, tra the traditional Turkish rug design has a blue, uh, a blue spot in the middle, and the floral design goes throughout, and there's a border, because it's meant to be a garden. I did not know this. Yeah. Wow. Cool. <laughs> so, from the beginning, God planted a garden. Became, became man's first home. It became God's first sanctuary. It's where God met mm -hmm. with man. Uh, and it's, as you say, it's enclosed. It's water flows through it. The water actually rises higher and then flows through the garden, the text says, and then parts in foreheads and goes out and waters the world. But this, this river then is the source of life for everything. And Adam and Eve are to start here. They're not to end here. Because on the first day of their lives, they're told, take dominion over the planet, fill the whole planet up. But it begins here, and Adam had already been put on probation. He'd been given a job to do, an apprenticeship, if you will. And, and that involved this little small area with two people in it. And it's a picture and a starting point for all that's going to come. Well, if they had been faithful, if they trusted God and relied on his grace and walked in faith, they would have told the devil where to go, appropriately enough. And in time, they would have taken the, the plants from the garden and carried them down the trail that led out of Eden. And down, they'd follow the rivers down along the banks. And they would plant more gardens, more oases out in what was now a howling wilderness. Because although it was 
not a fallen or cursed world. It wasn't a garden. Only Eden was a garden. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so this idea of the garden as a source from which things ought to go out is here from the beginning. But then as soon as they fall, something changes in the imagery. God puts guards at the garden gate. He puts these cherubim. Uh, and he puts a flaming sword, whether it operated independently or they swung it, we're not exactly told. But whatever it was, it was scary and dangerous and deadly and you didn't want to cross it. It was flame. And in the future, God's people could come this close to the garden. They might have been able to see the tree of life or not. They might have been able to see the glory of God or not. But they could sure enough look at these huge cherubim things that would look monstrous to them. We see the... You don't know what a cherubim looks like. Consult Ezekiel 1 for starters. Uh, there were monsters in the mountains. There were gods. Uh, that image has, has echoed down through the, the sculptures of the Mideast. But it, this, the presence of God is now walled off. It's sealed off. The gate is a living gate. It's these cherubim. And you can't get mm -hmm. past them. There's no way through. You can't get to God. God has walled himself off. He shut the door, as it were. And we can come to the door, but we can't come any closer. And if that's all there were to human history, human history would be abysmal and depressing and not worth telling. But from the beginning, God said, seed of the woman. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as Adam and Eve walked out the garden, out of the garden, walked down the path and looked back at it, and again, if you haven't read Ezekiel 1 lately, it would be a good thing to do. They would see the four alternating faces on the cherubim, the lion, the bull, the eagle. But then they would see a human face. And they would think, you know, that's, that should be us. We were the ones who were supposed to protect the garden. And, and Adam can think, I was supposed to protect the garden. In comes this serpent thing. And I should have grabbed it, tied it in a knot, and banged it on the head with a rock or something. Hmm. But I didn't. I did not fulfill my role as a guardian of the garden. And so now the cherubim are here, but notice the human face. It might be interesting to know whose face it was. Mm -hmm. But there would be a hint there. The garden is still there. God didn't blast the garden to pieces. He didn't set it on fire. He didn't collapse it into the ocean. Take it, rapture it up into heaven. It's still there. And one of the faces guarding it is still human. And so that put together with the promise and with the sacrament of sacrifice would lead them to understand that there's going to be a way back into God's presence. It's what we have done is horrible and vile and destructive, and yet God's going to find a way to bring us back. There's going to be a door, a way into the presence of God. Now we're 4,000 years away from Jesus. When he says, I am the way, I am the door. Mm -hmm. But the precedents are all set here. So the God's people could come and they could worship at the, at the garden gate. And uh, my own belief is that as they did, we were told that, that God recognized Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's. My own belief is that the flaming sword swooped down on it and lit it on fire. Because that's usually how God accepts sacrifices. He ignites them. But that's it. And for the next 1,600 years, that's as far as we go. We keep waiting. We keep looking. We keep hoping. But not everybody. Cain brought the wrong sacrifice, and then he murdered his brother, and he went off and he built a city. City is enclosed. Mm -hmm. uh, we come to the pagan world, and from the city of Enoch, Cain's city, to Babel, Babylon, when mankind erected a tower to reach to heaven. To all the cities of the ancient world, mankind understood the need for a community that was set apart from the rest of the world, that was indeed enclosed, mm -hmm. walled, that had fruit trees and vegetables and gardens and things that made it look beautiful and temperature-wise cool. Oasis, little oases, gardens enclosed. And they built cities. But as far as the records go, and here I reference, and you can help me with the pronunciation, the title is The Ancient City. Oh, Fustel, Fustel de Coulanche. 
Yeah. Thank you. I can never the pronounce classic the last text. Name. The classic text. It's yeah. wonderful. As far as I know, the author is not a Christian, but he uh, has a profound insight into into how the ancient city viewed itself. Mm-hmm. Cities were laid out magically because they were religious institutions. Now, uh, 200 years after the Enlightenment, we we sit back and think of religion and city. How does that even mix? The ancient world <laughs> could not imagine how they couldn't mix. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until the Enlightenment that anybody ever thought that a city couldn't be religious. Just a question of which religion? Which God are you serving? What holds this thing together? What provides your standards and your values? Whom do you serve and whom do you trust? Um, and and so the ancients would use, and, and here referencing, not going to repeat it all, all of our discussions at the beginning of this series on continuity of being, mm-hmm. the closeness, the interwovenness of God, the gods, man, deity, and and humanity, um, magic as below, so above. Uh, they, the sorcerers, the magicians, the sages, the patriarchs, whatever you call the priests would use their magic to divine the location that the gods had chosen. And the gods were very often your dead ancestors. Think of the Disney movie Coco here. And they would, by magic means, divine exactly where the site should be. And they would, with divine geometry, trace out the borders. And then they would plow the furrow that would represent the walls. We have a reference to this in the legend of uh, Romulus and Remus, Mm -hmm. where Romulus plows the furrow the ditch, the furrow itself, is the is the moat, and the dirt that's thrown up is the proto wall. Uh, Remus looks at this and despises it and jumps over and says, "That's what I think of your wall." And Romulus kills him on the spot, saying, "Thus be it ever to those who despise my walls." Uh, Rome was built on human sacrifice. It's a question of who calls the shots. Well, who is in touch with the powers that be? Who's in touch with ultimate reality? So Romulus or Remus? Is it this people or that people? Is it this priest or those priests over there? You have to make a decision and you have to make a commitment. And once you do, and once you build the walls, they are divine protection and divine identification. If People who live in the city worship the God that led them there. And usually at the center of the city, there is a temple Dedicated to that God. And again, often that God was simply your ancestor or a clan ancestor or something like that. Sometimes some some God or goddess representing the powers of nature, Baal comes to mind, but even Baal is an echo of ancient, of one or two particular ancient kings. And once you are in that city, you are bound together in that community by your common worship. And those walls keep out foreigners. Now I say foreigner. If I use the Latin word alien, we get a lot closer. We hear (laughs) alien today, and we think men from outer space. Green Little green men are tentacled monsters. And you know, as far as the ancient world was concerned, that wasn't too far off. Mm -hmm. Because we in this city are men. Those people, things out there, they look like men, but we're men. They're something else. Mildly put, they're strangers. But they are aliens, and they may be monsters. They they can come in and trade because we get something off of them that way. But they're not going to be part of this city until they conform to its religion, if that's possible. And it wasn't always in every system. Um, Rome was unique in that it spread its walls to the ends of the earth. And there were cities, for instance, Tarsus became an extension of Rome, and Paul being born in Tarsus was born Roman, was born free. Uh, Rome had a chip on its shoulder. It felt it could do that. Most cities <laughs> didn't. They, they, they raised their walls and they shut their gates and they were heaven on earth. They were where, it might not be a great heaven. You know, not all utopias are that great. And our generation's fascinated with dystopias. <laughs> um, but if you even go back and read the original, if you read Plato's Republic, it was not a great community by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> But this was this was the thing. It was dedicated to the worship of gods or a god. And if you wanted to be part of the city, you had to join their religion. Uh, the idea of free immigration was right out. 
and unless somehow it was there was a possible way of being inaugurated into the religious system, which in, in many cases was possible, but it was rarely easy, and it wasn't something you did just by signing on the dotted line or some such thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, and so there's a, a great, in that book by Fustel de Collange, The Ancient City, he describes the marriage ceremony in mm. ancient Greece. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's just, is a very succinct picture, I think, of the identity, not only of the, the city, but of the family, the family being a microcosm of the mm -hmm. city, where the household has its gods. And in order to change from one household to another as part of a marriage, you had to forswear all the gods of your house. Yes. And switch your loyalty over to the new house, which again, with the city was not like a viable option. <laughs> it was not no. an easy thing. No. And the reason that some, for instance, in Greece, that some states eventually began to recognize each other is they looked beyond their more immediate ancestors to some tribal ancestor mm -hmm. further back that they could all appeal to eventually in, in the case of Greece to Hellas, the historical or mythological, depending on what you think, uh, ancestor of the Greek people. There had to be somebody back there because if there wasn't, what did you have in common? Like, how could you trust each other? Another thing about um, the, the marriage thing, the practical economic implications were that daughters were not thought much of mm -hmm. because they're going to leave and go to uh, the household of other gods. What's important is that you have a son because he will pick up the rituals and honor the family traditions and keep the gods happy with your family. Mm -hmm. And therefore, adultery on the case of the wife was was treason. It was I don't know, horribly dangerous to the family. And so a woman who committed adultery would be executed. Um, daughters didn't matter much. You could adopt a son and teach him the mysteries. Um, better an adopted son who was faithful than a son born of the flesh who would not keep the secrets of the mysteries. But this this begins to define their their ethic of what's mm -hmm. important. Your land is important because your ancestors buried here. Your marriage is important because your wife had better give you a legitimate son. Your daughters, not so much. And your own faithfulness to your wife, it doesn't matter who you um, visit because they're not going to be part of the system anyway. I have like three thoughts that are related, I swear. So <laughs> <laughs> going back to the Romulus and Remus thing, they were brothers. They basically had everything in common they could have. And yet mm. they broke apart and they were the two cities. Now you have, my brain keeps going to Abraham in his whole thing, his whole story. He was going from city to city, seeing these cultures and seeing what his differences were, what they differed on. And then, forgive me, I cannot remember where the verse is, but Abraham searched for a city which had mm. foundations. Yep. Builder and maker is God. He Obviously, the foundations, what goes on top of the foundations? <laughs> Walls. And you think about Rami Sinus, they had everything in common they could possibly have, and they found differences. Every city, if you look hard enough, you can find differences, and they can break apart within themselves yes. and make more cities. And you're never going to find a perfect unity, no matter where you look, unless your city whose builder and maker is God. Mm -hmm. And all the people who live in the city are those under God's rule. That is one large city because everything is under God's rule. Mm -hmm. The um, ex excellent points. Yes, and we are headed in our discussion toward that city. That's where this is going to end up. Because, <laughs> yes, while um, the pagans were building their cities, God didn't give his people a city right away. And we'll talk more about mm -hmm. that next time and why not and what he gave them instead and how it all points forward. Um, you said that there's no way to um, to make people get along and not break apart. Well, as Christians, we say, yes. As pagans, we say, no, wait, there's a way. <laughs> it's called everybody listens to me and does what exactly. I Exactly. <laughs> you got it. As long everyone. as everyone looks out for my self-interest as much as I do, we'll be fine. Right. Yeah. And all we need for that to happen is I need to have all the power and uh, complete information on everybody. Um, and that requires extensive technology. So I know what people are th saying and thinking behind my back. 
And, There's no reason uh, for them the to money, ever write the money to make me. it work. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll find a that? way to make them happy. And again, look at the dystopias, 1984, Brave New World, uh, Fahrenheit 451, and others. And, and, and the brighter humanists have seen that this is where this goes. You want peace, then you have to hand somebody complete control. And that's been implicit from the beginning. So what are you going to say? Well, we don't trust anybody. Well, I trust me. Yeah, there's, see, there's kind <laughs> Does of anyone else? problem. And, <laughs> the and, only and so way <laughs> giving one person complete control doesn't backfire is if that one person with complete control has everyone's best interest at heart. <laughs> and surprisingly, there is only <laughs> one being who is there. <laughs> and <laughs> so... why his society works. We were talking about walls, but now you're talking about foundations. And so good. it all goes together. And this is what we're doing here is talking biblical theology. We're looking at things that we know from the world around us. And as we talk about them, we begin to see, oh, the Bible mentions that. Oh, and it mentions that. Oh, and it talks about this. Oh, and we're heading toward that. As we talk about God's world, surprise, surprise, we keep running into God's word. Uh, these are not two separate things. That's that's a, a Gnostic kind of a view of scripture where mm -hmm. theology is one thing and day-to-day -day life is something else. The Bible never presents it that way. Jesus, when he wanted to represent himself, said, I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the way. I'm the bread. Uh, come to me and drink. He used the language of common, ordinary things. And yes, he did speak of a sheepfold and he spoke of climbing up over the walls and how you shouldn't do that. We should go through the door. And he said, I'm the door. So there's more to talk about, a lot more to talk about, but this may be a good place to to wind up and do recommendations. And then we'll see how long it takes us to get through the rest of this discussion, because eventually we'll get to Nehemiah. <laughs> I hope so. He's my favorite. <laughs> All right. Um, I haven't decided what to recommend yet. So <laughs> anybody else want to go first? Rebecca, you got a recommendation? I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is a recommendation for specifically young people, because that's where I am. Um, doesn't really apply to y'all. Sorry. But um, what my are you saying? Never I'm mind. Saying I'm saying that, that you're that. married and you have a house, which uh, <laughs> disqualifies you from what I'm about uh, to say. So you're not young anymore, Emily. Sorry. Uh, I wish I well, had specifically the fact that. that you're married to <laughs> unmarried young people. Again, my demographic. Um, I am currently house sitting, and this is the third summer in a row I've done some form of house sitting, and it's really cool. Honestly, I would recommend it um, to people who are trustworthy. <laughs> I just keep getting <laughs> I keep getting recommended to people who I only kind of know, and then they recommend me to more. It yeah, but um, it's basically recommending living alone but on a trial period <laughs> <laughs> because living alone for me, it's a very interesting experience. Cause I've always lived with my parents or when I was away at school with someone else's parents, <laughs> but living alone gives me this. Um, it shows me what my bad habits are <laughs> that, <laughs> um, Oh, Wow, I should get on that, but I don't have other people to keep me accountable for. And also, what good habits could I have that I don't mm. because I'm easily distracted in my home environment that, okay, let me set myself up for success. I have done a lot of really good creative work while I've been alone, which is great. And then there are other things where it's like, oh, I do need people to keep me accountable for this. So generally, it's I recommend living alone for a very short period of time because it's a really <laughs> nice way to like refresh, mm -hmm. but specifically young people, because if you have a house and a spouse, you shouldn't leave them and live in someone else's house. <laughs> but True. Agreed. That would Agreed. be bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, on a related note, I guess <laughs> um, I'm going to recommend budget meetings. Mm. Um, with your family, David and I like these. We now and then we open a bottle of wine for them, and we did this week getting ready for this upcoming month, and it was just a good time. You get to talk about your values, things that you value, but not as much as other things, because that's the thing about 
dollar values. Like you have to assign them, right? You, you can't just say, ah, yes, this is the best thing ever. You have to say, how much of the best thing is this <laughs> right now in this situation with the limited dollars that we have? Um, so it really, really brings clarity. It's an opportunity for great communication and uh, dreaming together about what you would like those good habits to be as, as a family and that sort of thing. So it's it's great. We like budget meetings. I'm going uh, following sort of in the train of that. What's important, what's not important. My parents grew up in the Great Depression and had a depression mindset of we can get by. Hmm. We can save everything that comes into our house because we might need it sometime. And the things hmm. that my parents saved were silly at times. Pie tins and bread clippers and you know all, all, all kinds of things because you never know when you might need that. Now, on the one hand, it did keep them from getting into debt. Aside from the mortgage on their house, I don't know that my parents were ever in debt to anything. And their mortgage having been acquired in the late 50s, was mind-blowingly cheap because they didn't make a lot of money. It still, it took them a while to pay it off. Um, but their attitude of, um, yeah, this isn't working so well, but we, we, we can put off fixing it mm. is something I acquired. And I probably amplified it. Uh, Dad was good at, at doing spit and polish on all kinds of things and making them look a little awkward, but a little better than they had. Uh, he had more handyman skills than I have. I have virtually none. So I, I guess the side recommendation is learn how to do things and learn how to use YouTube. Mm -hmm. But the main point here is that it is better to tighten your budget now and then and fix things as you go than to wait till your ship comes in. If things are so bad that you you have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars just to make your home operable and livable, you're probably already in over your head. You probably have spent too much money already and you probably need to back back on your on your lifestyle. You're spending about a lot. But if not, then my advice is to look for places where you can spend a little less. And for instance, in our case, buy the new dishwasher. Mm -hmm. um, the last time we bought a new dishwasher, it was kind of a heart searching, soul searching. Can we afford it? Do we need it? And this time it was, oh, look, the plastic's broken. There's something black growing inside. <laughs> Home Depot, we want a dishwasher. <laughs> so, my wife, um, so my wife presented it to me as something she'd already done. And I completely agreed without a thought. <laughs> Um, and it's great. We are not, we're no longer poisoning ourselves, but we, mm. we knew the dishwasher was bad. We didn't know how bad. Mm. And so now I'm looking at our kitchen saying, all right, well, what's next? Because our oven, for instance, the, the door can fall off. It has at least twice. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> um, if you don't keep screwing in a certain screw, it will happen. And it can happen when everything's very hot. Um, two of the burners don't light unless you use a little uh, flame starter fire. You just get click, 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 and nothing happens. So we're, we're, we really need to, and so on. There's a planned obsolescence in today's appliances that didn't exist 40 years ago. My parents would buy something and it would last, you know, 20, 30 years. Now, 10 years is about it, and and we expect our appliances to to crash and burn. So my advice is, why are you doing your budget? Realize that as a factor. And do your maintenance as you go along. Keep things mm -hmm. up to date. Uh, it's it's healthier. It presents a better a better mental and spiritual environment when your house when you're maintaining your house and not letting it run down just because you're afraid to spend the money. Mm -hmm. It may mean some sacrifices or sacrifice. It may mean you may not get to spend the money on what you like. <laughs> yeah. That's not that's not sacrifice. That's mm -hmm. being smart. So there's there's my recommendation. I have um, kind of like weeding your things. garden, right? Yeah, like weeding your garden and waiting a garden mm -hmm. in point for us too. Um, mm -hmm. The last couple of years, I have not had a great deal of time out there. So so far, although school was out two weeks ago, every day except today when it was too hot, I have been out in the garden and I am doing catch up from two years ago because the weeds keep coming back. 
and flower beds have to be reinvigorated and and trees that are about to break fences and things need to be chopped back. This is an this is an ongoing process in life. And it's an ongoing process spiritually too. To put yourself on spiritual hold for two years because you have more pressing things than reading that book on theology or that book on worship or that book on marriage and family or you, you don't Bible. have time. The Bible. <laughs> you don't have time for prayer. I'll get to it. I'll I'll make time in a, in a few months. Not not a good thing. Um, the whole dominion mentality is one of at least maintaining what you got as best you can while pushing the boundaries. The danger, uh, particularly for young people, is to want to jump to the end. Mm -hmm. And it generally doesn't work that way. You mm -hmm. have to build a little at a time. Rebecca was our um, uh, producer for our uh, spring play. And although she did a lot of work along those lines, a lot of what she did was go back to all the stuff we've accumulated over the last 10 years or more and throw stuff out and catalog other stuff. I knew it needed to be done. I didn't know how badly it needed to be done. Mm. <laughs> uh, and, and it's not done. She did a fantastic job, but she had a finite amount of time. But at least start. And, and really, a lot that was there we could never use because we didn't even know it was there or how mm -hmm. to get it. So life is like that a lot. And either being afraid to, to face it, to face the junk and the cleanup, or thinking, ah, eh, we'll do it another day while we rush to this really exciting ending, are not signs of maturity. They're signs of something else. So there's yeah. my recommendation. And that ties in so well with what we've been talking about, with God planting a garden and saying, here, mm. maintain it. Yes. And then, then go beyond. Well... This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you both so much. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for joining us at very short notice. Um, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, if you'd like to send us an email, you can reach us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Uh, you can support us financially if you would like by visiting patreon.com slash haltingtowardszion. Big thank you to our financial supporters. You keep the show rolling. We appreciate you. Um, if you'd like to receive transcripts of our shows, you can get them from our Substack. Um, we have a generous trans transcriptionist who donates her time to make sure those are available to you. Uh, I'm not sure how to sign up on Substack. I'm pretty sure you would Google halting towards Zion Substack. Uh, that's that's what I would do. <laughs> Uh, we'll have to ask uh, you know. some time. Yeah, we'll have to ask you. I'm pretty sure that's what you do. Anyway, thank you again so much for listening. Hope to see you next time for a continuation of the biblical theology of walls. Good night. <laughs>